Okay, um, so good evening everyone. So my name is Michelle Tyndall, I'm a volunteer at IET Derby Knotts and welcome to this evening webinar. Um, so tonight we're welcoming Matthew Head to speak on the subject of dyslexia in engineering. So just um, to go through the slide I've got up, I've got a few links up on there. So the first one is to the IET East Midlands YouTube channel. So that's where previous talks that we've recorded are um, uploaded and also a recording of this talk will be available after the event. Um, the second link is to the Talking Together series, uh, the YouTube playlist. So this talk is part of a wider series where we've been working with the IMACE and Royal Aeronautical Society on the subject of well-being in engineering. And on there, there's talks from various industry leaders, including Warren East, the Rolls-Royce CEO, who's also a fellow of the IET. And then finally, uh, there's a link to the Dyslexia Life Hacks website, which is run by our speaker this evening. So just a short introduction for Matthew, which I'm sure he'll expand upon in his talk. So Matthew's day job is a senior vehicle design engineer. And alongside this, Matthew runs the Dyslexia Life Hacks website and podcast. So he's really looking to spread a positive message about dyslexia and aiming to make the lives of dyslexia day to day easier. So today he will talk us through his perspective on dyslexia and how this relates to his experiences in engineering. So we'll um, listen to Matthew speak and then there'll be a Q&A at the end. So if you can put your questions in the Q&A section as we go along, then we'll, we'll get to them at the end of Matthew's talk. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Matthew now. Thank you, Michelle, for the introduction. How I'm going to split the talk up this evening is to talk about my experience through education uh, with dyslexia and through my career and how being dyslexic has probably, in hindsight, affected how I've gone about that. The middle section of the talk will be dyslexia as an engineer, and then I'll go on to some management and leadership stuff at the end of the talk. So I got stamated with dyslexia at the age of six. I don't remember being stamated, but I have to rely on my mum to fill the story in. Apparently, my first year at school was quite a struggle. I would have a teacher that would sit me in a separate area of the class because I just wasn't keeping up with anybody. Luckily for me, the second year of school went smoother. The teacher there thought I had dyslexia and spent a lot of time reading about it and convinced the school board to get me assessed by an educational psychologist. So therefore, I got statemented with dyslexia. So it's been something I've known for pretty much as long as I can remember, which I know is not everybody's experience. Now, I went to school during the 90s. And what the assistive help I got at the time was having a teacher assistant with me in class sometimes, sometimes going out and doing separate lessons, and also getting extra time in exams. I don't have too many memories of primary school, so I'm going to focus really on secondary school. It always felt strange to me that I'd be in a class where I'd be getting really good high grades in science and with the same peers we go to an English class and I'd be really struggling. I'd be doing well at maths and then struggling with some of the other subjects. For one example, I remember getting a science test back and scoring 100%, the only person in the class to do it. Then moving to English with the same group of people and I've done an essay that's four to five pages my friends have done nearly 20 and they took less time to do it and of course got higher marks. This uh, is kind of quite a struggle at school and you end up kind of starting to build some self-limiting beliefs really or I did and you'll find that through this section of the talk I will bring up the word self-limiting belief quite a bit because you can't get your head around how you are doing really well with all your friends in one class and then completely struggling and really struggling when you get home. By the time I went, got to the end of school, I'd actually got good enough grades to get into college, which I studied a BTEC first, then national diploma in motor vehicle engineering. As a good example of putting a dyslexic person in the subject they love, I went from getting all right GCSE grades to getting student of the year in my first year. Um, and this, really surprised me. <laughs> you kind of shifted 
okay, I did do engineering and it moved away from sort of the strict English stuff, but I was still writing reports. But I, one report was writing about a motor racing world championship and I completely geeked out on World Superbike for a whole report and did the best report I'd done at that time. But by the time I got to the end of college at three years, I was about 19 at this point. And I was completely burnt out with education. Mentally, I was done. I also didn't really understand what a professional engineer was, um, partly through my own lack of research and sort of the guidance I was getting at the time. So I didn't want to stay in education for much longer. And in my mind, university is what clever people go to. And I thought I wasn't one of them. So I went into the workforce and worked as a HGV mechanic for eight years, mainly at Volvo trucks and then a stint at Mercedes-Benz. One irony about this, as I think of it in hindsight, is that yes, I got a technical job where I spend most of the time working with spanners on a vehicle. But post this, I'd have to write by hand the job card so it would be invoiced correctly. So the job that involved the most handwriting and had the least technology to help me, even just a basic word processor, is the one, the non-professional job that I chose because I felt I wasn't in a place to be able to do a professional job. <laughs> By my mid-twenties, I knew that being a mechanic was something I didn't want to be for the rest of my life. I had people 10, 20, 30 years older than me, and I just could see it all laid out in front of me. So I started reading what other jobs I could do. I think Castrol BP had an engine test station near where I grew up, which they used to develop the Royals. And I remember reading the job spec and realizing I can do that, can do that. I can certainly blow an engine up. I can take it apart. I can drain oil out of it. And then it's this must have an engineering degree. And I also realized being a huge motorcycle fan that Triumph Motorcycle want people in the UK to design their motorbikes. Again, I know lots about bikes, but didn't have this engineering degree. At some point I must have blinked because I'm now in my first lecture as a 26 year old at university. <laughs> to be kind of cruel, my first two lectures after eight years of being out of education were maths and dynamics. I remember seeing the integration symbol on the board and the lecturer asking who doesn't know what this means. I sheepishly put my hand up and then realized that I'm the only person in the classroom who knows this, who doesn't know what it is. So that was a shock. Coming back to the self-limiting beliefs. So here I am at uni, I have the offer. I'm in RG, Robert Gould's University in Aberdeen, and I'm on an engineering degree, but I feel like I don't belong for my first semester. But I keep passing class tests and maths tests. And then it comes around to exam times. And I'm having a panic that I'm not going to pass the maths exam. Like, what am I doing here? So I took the Stroud Engineering Mathematics textbook, which anybody who's not seen that is about two inches thick, and started at page one and worked my way all the way through it until the maths exam. Didn't do any past papers, just learnt maths out of the Stroud book. Cruelly, my university put the exams the first week back after Christmas. So I had an exciting Christmas holiday of reading about maths. Now, I left the exam thinking I'd scraped to pass. To my surprise, I got an A in it. So then I started to smash through some of these self-limiting beliefs and think, maybe I do belong here. Maybe I am smart enough to be here. One thing that had changed compared to being at school, because now we're talking the 2010s, is the assistive technology. I had applied for DSA, and I've got a laptop with a program called Dragon Naturally Speaking on it. This is a speech-to-text software. So you basically get to talk your reports to the screen and straight into Word. I've always described it as having a multi-lane motorway in my head when I'm talking about a subject, but it comes out on a little B road when I have to try and write it down. This kind of removes that barrier partially. Pro tip for anybody out there who uses this software, you need to talk to it like a Radio 4 presenter if you want it to behave. The sort of other part of this is having, and I can't remember if I had Clara read or text help, but this reads the report back to you. So you've dictated it in, 
done some editing, removed any quirks, got it to what you think is right, and then it will talk it back to you. Then put push play and let it talk it back to you. It's really surprising what you can pick up with audibly that you've completely missed, as you always end up reading back what you think you've written, not what you've actually re written down. I ended up, through my university career, getting invited onto the Fast Track Master's course because I had good enough grades in the first two years to do this. This involves doing a master's degree in summer before and after final year, so a constant run of education for a year, nearly two years. If you At 30, I graduated. If you'd asked a 25-year-old me who applied because they really wanted to not be a mechanic for their life, if they were going to even survive university, let alone come out with a master's degree, he probably would have laughed. But here I am as a 30-year-old graduating. It's really interesting, some of the, looking back in it, prepping for this talk, how some of the stuff I hung on to all the way through my 20s was proven completely wrong with my experiences at uni. And it's a shame, really, that I felt that I wasn't good enough to go to uni when I was younger. But it's made me who I am today, I think. Post-university, I took a graduate scheme in the Siemens Rail System, which I spent two years in. I want to touch back on assistive technology. So I still wouldn't tell anybody I was dyslexic. All I do is tick the form uh, when I apply for the job, but wouldn't mention it. And then when HR phoned me a few weeks in, I sort of like, no, I'm fine. One thing with using text-to-speech software sorry, speech-to-text software in the middle of an open plan office. I find it really weird to do that while everybody can hear what you're saying. I'm sure it's not the way you get invited to coffee mornings either. But really, in hindsight, I probably should have taken the opportunity. One thing about being dyslexic and one of the powers of it is the ability to learn things fast. So I really enjoyed my time on the graduate scheme because I was able to start new jobs every four months and learn them really fast. I was a management accountant for a few months, project manager, did business excellence, quality assurance, and of course, rail crash repair. But I realized by the end of this, that my heart was in design. This was um, helped by a trip to Vienna, looking at a quote that Siemens were doing at the time and sitting with a design engineer while they're on about this new coupling they're trying to create. I find myself mid-meeting, talking with him, trying to design it. <laughs> I just knew then I needed to go design things. So I applied for the job at Triumph Motorcycles that um, I'd seen all them years ago before I'd applied to uni. Thought if nothing else, I get a tour around the factory that my motorbike at the time was built in. Well, I got the job and I spent three years there working as a design engineer, which I really love and suits my strengths. And to my excitement when I turned up, I realized we were doing a brand new model that gets released in a week or so, the Tiger 1200. And this is the type of bike I like to ride. So I was basically designing the sort of thing I'd buy. This design environment, as I've mentioned, suits me. And I think kind of hides sort of my dyslexia more, if for want of a better phrase, because I'm working on 3D imaging, which does suit the way my brain works. Unfortunately, 2020 rolled around and the COVID-19 pandemic came with it. And Triumph let go of half the design team making it redundant, myself included. While I was out of work for six months, this is when I developed Dyslexia Life Hacks. The seed of this had started years before with sitting with a project manager while I was on my grad scheme, and we both dyslexic and couldn't spell a word. I'm not thinking, but I've got the thing down on the, my mobile phone down on a meeting room table. And I just asked Siri to spell the word out to me, which it diligently does. He looks at me, he's like, I didn't know you could get phones to do that. So oh, yeah, yeah, that's brilliant. And I showed him a couple of other things and he was kind of like, mm, it's really frustrating, I don't know this. And I, got, I then started keeping this kind of stuff as a list on my phone, picking up a few over the years. So when I, again, had the six months of unintended free time, I thought, I'm going to learn how to develop a website. I'd also broken my wrist, so it wasn't going anywhere. So I developed the website, and it's a list of hacks, tips, and tricks, and little sort of gateway things that I found out over the years. 
to help dyslexic people. Hopefully it will find people will find it useful in their, their work and then go and look at more formal stuff like the software I've already mentioned. There's also now a podcast series where I interview other dyslexics to find out how they cope with life as a dyslexic. Um, luckily for me, I managed to then get a new job at uh, RML Group, which is where I currently work now on a fixed term contract till January. This is a move from two to four wheels. And it's quite exciting because we're developing a very fast car. One thing that's changed from the Triumph job to RML job is obviously I've taken ownership of my dyslexia. And I went and did a dyslexia correction program called the Davis Method just before I started. And that really helped with some of the issues I was having with it. And it filled me with a lot more confidence. It finally kind of lost some of the spelling and grammar stuff that was a bit of a problem. So that kind of gets me to dyslexia as an engineer. I've got some points which uh, are attributed to dyslexia. So dyslexics tend to be creative, big picture thinkers, problem solvers, and they think in 3D. So start touching on the creative first. Obviously as engineers, we are looking for innovation and creative solutions to improve products and build a better world and society. Being a creative thinker, a dyslexic person might look at a problem and think, well, what about this? Or how about spinning it through here? Really kind of being a diverse way of thinking. It's an alternative way of thinking is how dyslexia is and creativity is a big part of that. The bigger picture thinker ties into this. Rather than homing in on some of the detail, Dyslexic people tend to stay out and look at the bigger picture, able to spot patterns and trends. So you might be as a design team trying to work out to link A, B and C together, tried loads of ways. And then a dyslexic person looks at it, sees a pattern that if he links A to Z back to B and into C, then why wouldn't that work better? And I could point some point bits on this new bike triumph for launching that is a bit different and they're bits I've designed which I think is to quote the charity name made by dyslexia at points. Dyslexics are also big problem solvers. <laughs> Unfortunately having a bit of a battle with the school system you do spend quite a lot of your early life trying to solve problems. I think trying to put a positive spin on some of it this instills a level of grit and determination that gets you fired up and driven forward if you can get the right support along the way. You look at the number of inventors and entrepreneurs that are dyslexic. Um, Bill Gates, Steve Jobs, Elon Musk is autistic, so he's on the neurodiversity spectrum. But this is to do with the big problem solving and the creativity that being neurodiverse brings. People might have, um, people might have uh, heard about dyslexic people thinking in pictures rather than narrative. Well, this is brilliant when you're looking at an engineering problem. I'm aware sometimes that I don't need as much on CAD to be able to explain a point. However, I do need it on CAD to explain it to some of other people who their strength is not necessarily picture thinking. Also, as a beginning engineer and learning how to use CAD, the main thing I needed to do, I'd already designed the part in my head. I just couldn't get the computer to do, get it out of my head onto the page. If anybody can develop a thing, I can just stick on the front of my head to do this. This would speed up my productivity a lot. But it's great. You can section in your own mind. Imagine engines spinning around. If you're an electrical engineer, probably manage stuff going through circuitry. And just having that 3D understanding and twisting things around is great. It actually links back to some of the letter flipping. There's a theory that the 3D thinking when you're looking at flat letters on a page and spinning around is why dyslexic people flip B's and D's. But in an engineering environment, thinking in 3D is a huge advantage. Now, of course, we all want to build balanced teams. And I've cited some famous dyslexics that have driven innovation. But if you dig deeper into the stories, there's always other people there with them. And this is where I believe that we can have 
neurotypical, neurodiverse of all kind in balanced teams. Think about it. Do you want a team, do you want an orchestra that's full of people who can play all the instruments okay? Would you want an orchestra that has got a pro violinist and a pro trombone player? And then it sounds like the Philharmonic and we can drive the world forwards better as engineers with these big diverse alternative thinking teams. Management and leadership. Um, I, this is not gonna be a huge dive into exactly how to manage a dyslexic person because on an individual le level, all dyslexics are slightly different. But I wanted to touch on a few key points. If you have somebody in your team that you believe is dyslexic and they haven't told you, then that's probably something you want to talk to your HR about and see what the process would be. So let's assume they've told you and you know. I think you should give dyslexics room for ideas, time to process, and a single point for checking work. What do I mean for room for ideas? I, even back at my mechanic days, I was able to, by the time I got quite highly experienced, was able to fix one truck while telling the apprentice how to diagnose the lorry next to me. And it's the same in an engineering office. If I'm listening in and don't have headphones on, my brain is trying to solve the idea of the person sat next to me or the other conversation, as well as the thing I've got going on on my screen. So what I, where you go for room for ideas is if you're talking to a dyslexic person and asking them how they plan to problem solve this particular problem, they are likely to tr problem solve that and come up with three or four other ideas or other things they've heard about, or even on this problem, how they can turn it around. And it can be tempting to just kind of cut it back and go, no, can we focus on this? However, the idea things come from the creativity and it comes from enthusiasm. So I believe if you give them enough time to allow the ideas to grow and then pair it back, you don't kind of kill the enthusiasm. I, I've worked in places where I'm bouncing ideas off the place and it does feel quite disheartening when somebody just stops you dead. Time to process. So time to process. Dyslexic people can sometimes struggle with processing memory and processing speed. A bit like having a computer, the RAM is nearly all used up. It just takes a little bit of time to churn through. So you may be in a meeting and your colleague looks like they've gone blank and they're not listening, but that's probably their mind just churning through all the data that's coming to them. It's also quite good if you're disseminating information to sort of slow down and give them time to write things down. If you think about it, if somebody's telling me how to do something, I'm not only having to focus on how I spell it, I'm also having to think about what they're saying and write it down. So I can discuss a few points and then maybe put it in a bullet point on Zoom, email, whatever, just to have it down as a good list and a simple and clear bullet point list. So you're not having to distill stuff out of text. I tacked on single point of clarity for checking work. Um, this is something that post doing the Davis course that I've been on is not so much of a issue for myself, but I used to find if I was writing reports and getting them proofread, multiple people have multiple different writing styles. And you end up getting stuck in a loop where you're trying to fix the report. It's not going to be able to write the report perfectly every time because it's not my strong point. However, I can learn how somebody wants me to write the report, to write it to suit. So having confusing different things, you just end up in a complete, knot and a ball of elastic in your head and really struggles and i think that's just kind of some of the ways of helping get the most out of some of your dyslexic colleagues another thing i want to mention is mind maps if you've got somebody who's struggling to get their ideas out and into order mind mapping is a good way of putting it down on a page and getting it all sorted and straightened out and in a way just parking it <laughs> before going on and planning further forwards what about a dyslexic person who's now a leader? Now, we've already mentioned quite a few positive points about dyslexia and how they, what they bring to being an engineer. Think about it. You've got a leader who can see the big picture and lets their subordinates get into the detail. They're looking at patterns and trends. And there's many stories where somebody does okay as a subordinate and then they get a leadership position and overachieve. It's likely a dyslexic person who's been promoted to something that suits them. 
I want to finish off this part of the talk with just one question. And that is, should I tell anyone I'm dyslexic? Now, I'm going to compare two people, the 25-year-old me and the now 37-year-old me, because they all answer the question two completely different ways. So let's look at the 25-year-old me. He has less gray hair for a start and is a little bit thinner. But he wouldn't tell anybody. I remember filling in job cards at workshops and getting complained at because the invoice can't read it. Why is your writing so bad, Matthew? Oh, I just didn't pay attention to school. I try and shrug it off and keep it all internal. And this just kind of ties you in knots. Like It's just not a fun place to be. Now, obviously, running a website about dyslexia and doing talks on dyslexia, I'm clearly telling people I'm dyslexic. They can see it on my CV, my LinkedIn profile, wherever I am on social media. But it also allows me to take ownership of it. It allows me to find other things out there that might help me. So if you know dyslexic and you Google words like life hacks, you'll come up my website. There's various companies and methods and tools that I've mentioned through this talk as well that to help you along the way. It also allows you to take ownership and really work out where your strengths lie because dyslexia is a different way of thinking and it's only because we use exams and the written word to communicate and test people that you're aware that there may be something different. I had somebody on the other day who loved reading audiobooks and was talking to one of their friends who hated audiobooks, couldn't get any information out of it, had to read it. Now imagine if audiobooks were the norm. I wouldn't be dyslexic, but somebody who reads and can't get on with audiobooks would be. So I think taking ownership is a big step forwards. And if people uh, still carry prejudice against you, well, that's up to them. But as engineers, we are trying to create bigger and better things and improve the world through engineering. And I think having dyslexic people on your team really help put the diverse thinking into whatever project you're involved with. I want to thank everybody for listening to this part of the talk and we'll pass you back to Michelle for the questioning and answer session. Hey, hi everyone. Uh, yeah, thanks thanks a lot for that, Matthew. I'll, 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 normally there'd be a round of applause here, so I'm going <laughs> to give a round of applause. I'm sure everyone else would join in and there's been lots of really good comments as well in the, uh, in the chat. Uh, yeah, people clapping by text. Brilliant. Thank you so much for sharing. But yeah, there's a few comments I'll, I will just read out. Um, people really identifying with what you're saying. Um, everything Matthew is talking about is so amazingly exactly describing what it is like for a dyslexic in so many settings. And um, a few other people saying how similar your experiences are to theirs. So um, yeah, I think there's a lot of appreciation here. So yeah, I have had a a few questions pop up in the Q&A. So um, I'll start that there is one about CPD. I'll, I will come to that at the end. But um, yeah, a question from an anonymous attendee. Um, is spelling your main issue? Um, do you find yourself writing in well-constructed sentences rather than good grammar? So yes, spelling and grammar tends to be my main hang-ups. Uh, as I mentioned, I did do the Davis course, which has helped correct a lot of that. Um, but it is it was a huge problem for me, just not having any film being completely and utterly blind to it. Yeah, OK. Um, right, OK, yeah, there's quite a few questions popping up. <laughs> well, that's a good sign. Yes, OK, so what would have helped you if someone said when you started school, started work or start some other critical time in your life? So I guess what yeah what would have helped you at those different times in your in your life when you were starting school or work or a, a job I guess as well. Uh, in terms of the dyslexia thing, I think sort of my experience recently and obviously being in the dyslexic world and finding that there's all these tools out there is having awareness of the wider dyslexic world and having awareness of the amount of professional people that are in these jobs like. It's wonderful that people like Richard Branson, Lewis Hamilton come out and talk about it, Jamie Oliver, another one. However, there's some, in my head, there was a big gap between them and me here. And I think 
having some role models that are accountants, engineers, and people of that ilk really help kind of bring that on. But really understanding why what there was out there would have really helped me, particularly at school. I mean, I the school system, they you know, they did give me the extra help, but actually I found out more as I've gone to university and later on in life. But I think I was 90s was fine because they knew about dyslexia, but then I think it's really the early 2000s when it really shifted gears in terms of the assistive technology and what you've got. Because it really surprised me at university how much different. I even had scribes, which I forgot to mention in the talk. And that was great. I was talking about a particular ethics and engineering exam so and giving them so much detail that they couldn't keep up with it. <laughs> so I needed two scribes for that exam. <laughs> But I didn't have two scribes. I did only have one. He just had to keep having a break. Brilliant. Okay. Um, okay, let's go. Uh, okay, someone who's saying their son is studying A-levels and is keen to do an engineering degree, but he seems to need maths A-level to do this. Are there other routes in? I don't know. Did you, did you do maths A-level, Matthew? I didn't do any A-levels. I did BTEC National Diploma. I mean, <laughs> You're the, I'm the wrong person to ask for the conventional route through education and work because I disappeared off and turned spanners for years before coming back. So I don't know with the engineering A-level thing. I don't know if you know any better, Michelle. Yeah, no, not, not personally. I didn't actually do an engineering degree, so um, ah. I'm, not, I'm not conventional either. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I, I, I do assume there are other, other routes, but, yeah, I can't, can't help directly with that. Sorry. Um, okay, uh, we've got another question here. I'm I'm dyslexic and haven't had the courage to disclose it to any of my employees so far. Firstly, have I broken any rules here? Secondly, are there any tips about how, how I can do it a decade into working for my current company? I don't think you've broken any rules. I don't know for sure, but you are covered by the Disability Act anyway. So I would say... Yes, you should do, because I think if you disclose your employee, employer, sorry, and they are sympathetic to you, then that's a sign of a really good employer. I mean, I've literally been grilled in a job interview for being dyslexic because they want to know what this strange thing was. And it made me leave thinking, well, I don't want to work for that person. <laughs> so I think you should do. And I would like to think that they are understanding enough that there's a quite heavy emotional side I think to being dyslexic as I touched on in the talk and trying to keep it all in terms of yourself just ends up being this kind of internal circle thing so yeah certainly I think telling people and look at the way that dyslexia has been talked about and neurodiversity in general has been talked about differently in recent time you've got the gift of dyslexia dyslexia is a superpower all these kind of things that are coming up and how neurodiversity is a positive thing that people should have it's a big change from what it was even when I was back in school. Okay, yeah, thanks for that, Matt. Um, okay. Uh, Philip Brown's asked, could your survival method be relevant to people with a brain injury? Hmm. I have no clue, to be honest. I would think that was really specific to whatever the brain injury is and how that's affecting you. All I can tell you is if you go to my website and look at some of the hacks and some of them resonate with you and give them a go if that works great then that's the only way i can sort of see it fitting in okay um have you had any experience of the support that has been offered on external training courses well i think you mentioned the specific course that you went on didn't you? do they well do they mean external training courses like you're working for a company and they send you on a training course to improve your skill at the job or are you on about a dyslexia specific training course because i mentioned that and that is brilliant support on external training courses again probably should be able to have help with it but i do remember having jobs where it's even at college where i'd be mainly with the motor vehicle engineering lecturers all the time but we go off and disappear and do a english-based thing with somewhere else in the college because they've got no clue because they don't see you all the time and that is really tricky and really hard as an 18 year old to tell them as well um but yeah, you should get the support all the way through. And I think if your employer knows, and people are quite un should be quite understanding, and yeah. I've found that most of the time they are. So if you tell them a heads up beforehand, look, dyslexic, can I 
bring X, Y, Z, depending on what you prefer. Some people prefer to record things and some people prefer to have the notes to them rather than having to write everything down when they should be accommodating. Yeah, yeah, good advice. Um, is it, yeah, this is an interesting one. Uh, what would you say about the standard college university practice of giving more time for writing in an essay or for a report? Um, I guess, do you think that's helpful and useful? Uh, I think it is helpful. Um, I would be, quote unquote, more dyslexic when I'm under pressure. So you can imagine exam time. So I think having more time for writing does help, although it's never going to quite fix the problem with writing, which is where my university used to give us scribes that kind of eliminates the problem. Because as engineers, particularly in that exam, we're not being tested on our ability to write. We've been tested on our understanding of whatever the subject was of that exam. Um, but I used to use quite a lot of the extra time in the exams I was strong at to read the paper through and get calm before starting the exam, um, which sometimes used to wind my friends up as I'd lean back in the chair and put my feet out and read the exam as they're scribbling away. Um, but it, that's, the, that's the profile thing coming in. So you don't get assessed an extra time putting in the stuff you're weak, they just put it in across the board. So uh, dyslexia tends to have a sort of sore, sawtooth profile where you're really good at something and weak at something else and it all balances out at the end yeah. but if you're in an exam for a subject you're really good at the extra time is <laughs> a luxury but yeah i've been literally at the clock dying on other exams still writing stuff down particularly as at school but i prefer using scribes if it's available to you versus um having the extra time to write stuff down yeah yeah okay um so why, why did you try the Davis course at the time that you did? And had you consider it, considered it when you were younger? I didn't know about it when I was younger. Uh, when I'm born in 84. Davis Foundation was founded in 81. And I didn't find out about it till 2021. So <laughs> what, what it was, I'd launched the website. And the website's been a great learning experience for me because it put me in the world of neurodiversity and dyslexia. And, and I found lots of other things. Part of trying to promote it is I, if you Google dyslexia.com, it's the Davis method that comes up. So I dropped bung them an email. Like, I've created this website. And they're like, well, this looks really nice. Have you read our book, The Gift of Dyslexia, which I recommend quite a lot of people to read, even if you're not dyslexic, because they go through what it's like to be dyslexic at the beginning of it. And I, when I say read it, I put it on my car and list it on Audible while driving around at Christmas. And I'm driving along the M40 thinking, wow, this person knows me. <laughs> That's how my brain works. Wow. Okay. And by the time it got to the point of the book where it's like, you need a helper or go do a course, I'm like, I need to do this. This really, really, I need to do this. This thing sounds perfect. They've just described how my brain works, why my brain works, all the sort of stuff I do. I need to just try the course and see what happens. And it was really, really interesting I'm not going to dive in too much to what the Davis method is, but it's about it's about having stopping your mind disorientating and changing things, and then you end up modeling the meaning of words. So you model them in 3D and model the alphabet, which stops all the flipping around because your brain has the right picture for it rather than having a scrambled picture across. Yeah, I think I've written an article about it somewhere. I can drop a link in. Yes. Okay. Yeah, that would be good. Yeah, just a, a reminder for people. I can see that there's lots of um, there's lots of comments in the chat and there's a few questions going in there but I'm going down the, the ones in the Q&A so if you definitely want me to get to your question then please put it in the Q&A so next next question in the Q&A um, so what single priority change do you think would make it easier for people to recognize and support people in their early career rather than being dismissed as incompetent single priority change Hmm. But obviously, from a personal point of view, telling people you're dyslexic helps because obviously they do may think, why is this person not able to read? Um, but I think mainly the thoughts around it, like I cited through the talk, the many positive things being dyslexic brings. And I think having people who think that, hey, I've got a dyslexic person on my team, awesome, 
let's see what they can do with this, this, and this, and working out their strengths and knowing that they've got a powerhouse of a certain type of thing that's going to really help their team. That's where stuff really needs to change. And it is starting to change, just never quick enough as always. <laughs> um, but that's kind of where you need to come into. Well, you know, almost to the point where if somebody goes, oh, you're dyslexic. Oh, yeah, cool. And then we carry on normally. That's kind of what we want, where we want to be at. Yeah. But it would help. It would help that attitude. It help you feel more comfortable about being a dyslexic person in the workplace, more comfortable with asking your colleagues for help. I mean, I've done it. I've had to get one of my colleagues to pre-read a presentation in the morning. Um, and then in the afternoon, I'm helping him with his FEA analysis. So we all bring different things in. And it's remembering that people come to you for, to ask things. And you might have to come to them and go, how do I spell this word for argument's sake? Yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah, somebody here. So they're also a mechanical design engineer who started out as a mechanic and is currently trying to retrain in systems engineering and did they said they struggled to learn quickly enough and missed out on opportunities um, they say their employer knows that they're dyslexic and they tell colleagues but i still struggle with people's patience any thoughts on how to educate people to be more patient with dyslexic staff hmm. that's it yeah I think I've heard, I've heard it referred to in various dyslexic webinars as upskilling other people. Um, I think having a better understanding of it, like mm -hmm. it is just a little bit of understanding goes a long way. And that's not just dyslexia. That's anything in the world, isn't it? If we all understand each other better as individuals, we all get on a lot better. And then you can, they can, there's plenty of resources out there, not just my own, but other places that you can go to. Made by Dyslexia do a lot of good facts and figures about it. And that's really the only way you're going to get people to give you the time to work. And also, as I sort of keep coming back to this point, remember it. Remember what your strengths are. Because some of the stuff that's taking time is, um, I like the idea of the shadow of the strength. So you have this strength, but there's a sh it casts a shadow at points. And that's where you kind of the dyslexic strength comes in with a bit of a shadow. And just remember, it's the shadow of your strength rather than being a complete weakness. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, it would be, it would obviously be good to see um, companies raising awareness. And I, I guess it's unfortunate if it falls to you as an individual to try and do that. But that, like, there's lots of good resources, as, as you've said. Mm. Um, um okay yeah we've got lots of questions here this is yeah i can see that <laughs> um so what is your advice to someone when dyslexia is not picked up at primary school and they're not given support at a young age you can you can only work with what you're given can't you so if you don't realize that you were dyslexic at primary school all you can do once you realize that you're dyslexic is then dive into what support is available for you now and then learning how to work as a dyslexic person going forwards and it it's something I don't have a lot of experience with obviously being picked up as young as I did but talking to various people with it like I do they always sort of you know what in hindsight would you have changed you're like well yeah the past is what the past is and actually maybe it's forged me into the person I am now even unfortunately if it, if it was a struggle but going forwards, I now use this. I spoke to somebody recently who really struggled at university. And in their final year, they found out they were dyslexic and got the assistive technology when they went and redid a second course. And it changed university for them from being an absolute slog to something they loved doing because they loved the subject and now had the tools to allow them to access the subject in the way they wanted to. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I guess it is unfortunate and I, I do think what you reflected on that things are evolving and changing and I've got family members who are, are dyslexic and, and they were picked up at quite a young age as well so yeah I hope that continues and um, yeah this is maybe on a, a, a similar theme so um, there are there is a bit of I'll, I'll read that out but let's just start with the question so are authorities in the UK supporting dyslexia friendly schools and informing the public about their existence are you aware of anything in that area Matthew or? I'm not no I wouldn't I wouldn't want to comment because it's not an area of research 
Okay, yeah, so just, just to uh, follow up with some of the comments uh, from that person. So they said that um, in Scandinavian countries, there does seem to be focus on providing support for children and students um, and talking about uh, people that they've worked with that have been given support and reflecting that it's um, better to have students included in the normal curriculum, but with their needs being catered for, which I hope is the experience of, of people, but I, I guess, we, yeah, I mean, obviously we don't know, know that for sure. Um, okay, so oh, yes, interesting one again on exams. How, how was your experience with using a scribe for a maths heavy subject where you had lots of equations or figures as part of your assessment? Well, the, the maths <laughs> exams are always great because I just wrote the equations down by hand and it's not a problem. So I actually didn't use a scribe until my fourth, because uh, I went to the University of Scotland, so it's a four-year degree, not three, fourth year and through my master's. So what I'd found was that I was getting really good grades in the first two years. But as the grade, where I noticed the drop-off was not in the maths-heavy subjects, it was in the, the other subjects that were becoming more and more exam essay-based. And that's why I was like, hang on, I need to do something about this and started using the scribes. And you can see the uptick again in it. There was a couple of points. I remember having a protest exam because I got a lower mark than I expected. And then went and reread it and realized that the marker had uh, gave me zero points because I'd used the wrong where. So arguing that actually we're not doing that. This is a maths exam. I bumped it up by two grades. So that's annoying. But I didn't really want to use a scribe and I knew another dyslexic person who did because the scribe just sits there for most exam while you're banging out the formulas and working it all out and then does the very short bits. But actually, maybe in hindsight, I should have brought them in for some of the exams because particularly the one I've just mentioned, I would have got a lot higher grade, I think. Hmm. Yeah, that doesn't sound like great marking. Um, uh, so, yeah. <laughs> okay. yeah, well, like one of my uni friends really helped me with the protest on that one. <laughs> Okay, um, any suggestions for improving organization of thoughts and ideas and being able to communicate them? Hmm. So I mentioned my mapping through the talk, which comes up quite a lot uh, when I'm interviewing people for the podcast. Now, that's great, and there's various different ones. There's a website called Bullet Mapper, can we do it? Um, a thing called Mind View I've had recommended that's supposed to help you put all your thoughts and ideas down. And that really helps with just putting it all down. What was the second part of that question again? Sorry, I died. Uh, You've <laughs> been bombarded with questions. Um, yeah, so uh, suggestions for improving organisation of thoughts and ideas and being able to communicate them. I think that's a bit you were looking for. Yes, so I think the mind mapping gets it down and then it's communicating across. Now, this is that's once you've got it all down with the mind maps i think you're there in a better place to kind of line all your thoughts in a row to really get them communicate across it's something i'm kind of still working at is actually if you stand the thing on its head rather than how does a neurotypical person talk to a dyslexic well how does a dyslexic talk to a neurotypical person so they understand how they think because thinking in pictures versus narrative is very different and it's still something i'm kind of working at so i don't really have a great answer apart from mind maps for that question yeah okay yeah i guess i guess it's for us all to be aware that everyone is is thinking and communicating differently isn't it um okay uh, sometimes in engineering you need to dig into the literature read a lot of textbooks how did you deal with projects which involve doing a lot of this background reading yes yes you are correct now, now obviously as a design engineer i would kind of what i tended to do really is I kind of believe on using sort of almost just in time information rather than reading a lot of stuff at the beginning that I might forget. So I will normally find some way that it's a lightweight version of it. I'll even use videos. If I'm having to research something and I'll look in the videos, to, I, mean, I used to use Khan Academy at uni all the time for the math stuff and get a sort of basic understanding, maybe even the Wikipedia article and then dive in to the text at that point. By that point, I've got to kind of skim top of it and can understand but really i try and find as many ways as i can to convert things into pictures <laughs> um, okay okay as a 40 plus year old and having never been diagnosed 
but now has their partner that have spotted a lot of dyslexic traits in them and they're looking to get diagnosed but don't know how to go about it. Do you have any advice for them? I would say go and look at the British Dyslexia Association's website and start there. That's a good point to start. They do have a lots of tips of where you can go. And I can't remember if it's them or somebody else does have a bit of an online test. And there's even Bullet Map Academy do a iPhone app that you can, or a mobile phone app, sorry, that you can download and see how, do a dyslexic test to see how dyslexic you are. Okay. The guy was like 92. Smash that test. <laughs> Didn't need to revise for that one. Yeah, yeah didn't, not at all. <laughs> um, okay, a question here. How do you cope with reading out loud? How do I cope with reading out loud? So I don't tend to read out loud unless I have to. Again, did the Davis course, which helps with quite a lot of my reading. But like, I had notes for this talk, but I will actually learn the subject and talk it out and just have notes to ground me if I get lost. I've, yeah, I will tend to try and learn the thing and talk ad hoc out loud rather than having to read from a page because it that's quite stressful mm. okay. um okay yeah so this is a question about again in well stressful exam situations <laughs> um you say you can get a scrambled picture when thinking uh, did it, does this also result in slow slash overthinking or changing your mind quite often or second guessing yourself, I guess, in, in an exam setting? Yes, it can do. Yep, most definitely. That's kind of, that is, you can get a scramble picture. It's a problem with thinking of loads of things at once. Sometimes it all ends up being a scramble. And yes, you can. I've ended up doing that in high stress exam situations and getting myself in a complete and utter knot. Mm -hmm. And the only thing I can do is stop, <laughs> stop, breathe, maybe switch to a different question or dive in the back of the paper or whatever to kind of come back to it. Cause yeah, you can dive down. The problem with what well, pitch thinking is that you can think faster in pitches than you can in narrative. But if you're diving down the wrong road, you have got down there a lot faster <laughs> and a lot further before you realize you have to back the hell up and go the other way. So yeah, it, it is hard, and I have messed exams up for that very reason where I've just got tied in knots. And sometimes even now at work, you sat there and you're thinking away and you're designing something and you turn it around, spin it inside out and backwards, and you're like, no, no, no. I've Having the ability to understand how your own mind works, which comes back to what I was saying about owning the fact you're dyslexic, you can then start picking up on, hang on, I've just completely disoriented down this road. I'll go do something else or do a little meditation thing or something just to kind of whatever suits you to snap you back into where you need to be. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Useful advice. Um, okay. This is an interesting one. Um, I quite often train members of my team. What mm -hmm. techniques can I use to help connect with people who may be dyslexic? I often worry that my style is not accessible enough for everyone. Mm. Pictures. <laughs> Visual aids. Really, um, that's the big thing. So, again, if you've got a diverse team, you you may even have an autistic person who loves all the text. Um, but, uh, yeah, simple bullet points, visual aids. There's always multiple ways of conveying the same thing. So I think you kind of want to help everybody in your team because you're trying to drive the team forwards as much as you can. But certainly, if you're a dyslexic person, they're likely to prefer visualize and pictures i will always have stuff in pictures in my memory than i will written down in text okay. right i think we're getting to the end of our questions and we are coming up to the hour yeah someone here says that they've just applied for a senior engineer's position and wondering about informing them at the interview if they're dyslexic they're saying they only found out in their late 40s that they were dyslexic um yeah i would yeah. think about it if you're applying for a senior position then you were doing quite well in your career aren't you so you've got this far being dyslexic and depending on how the person you're the interviewers thought of it they you they may think you've even overachieved if you are dyslexic if you got that far and are doing that well as a dyslexic person what else can you do so i would 
tell them in the interview dyslexic remember it's a positive thing so always talk about it in a positive light not a negative one but certainly tell them like yeah i'm a dyslexic person it, <laughs> it's my favorite answer to that classic interview question of what is your strength and weaknesses it's the same thing it's this 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 and this 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 which is talking about dyslexia but yeah certainly getting that far in your career and as a dyslexic person, there's nothing stopping you. So I think letting people know. Yeah. It's great. Brilliant. Um, okay, someone here who is asking about the best pathways to become an engineer. Um, they, they're they saying they've been a HGV mechanic for 30 years and a, a lab tech for four years. Okay. Uh, I'm wondering cool. how they can progress um, and what steps they could take. So I completely gave the whole thing up and went to university. Um, so depending on whether your lifestyle can tolerate that, that is great. Particularly as a dyslexic person, it allowed me to kind of focus on studying and focus on breaking down some of the beliefs that I incorrectly held. Um, but definitely a path of engineer, depending on what your, I guess if you've been an HGV tech for 30 years and in a lab tech, you probably don't have the A-level grades. So it'd be worth having a look. I even, when I started, bunged messages to university to see what they wanted so there's foundation degrees you can do through which gets you onto a main degree so mm -hmm. i would start there i'll see universities what they want what levels you probably you're probably going to need an a level in maths and science i would have thought of minimum and then maybe a foundation degree but i went to university with somebody who also had a career change similar age to me he used to be a bus driver and he did a foundation degree and then the main engineering degree um, yeah, someone here just saying, can you that you repeat the name of the, the blog website? So yeah, it's Dyslexia Life Hacks. And I've put that in the, I put a link to Matthew's website in the chat at the start. And um, yeah, and like I said, this talk will, yeah, is has been recorded. It will go up onto the IET East Midlands YouTube channel as well. And I will definitely make sure we can put a few links in the description for that, Matthew, as well, with some of the things that you've uh, been highlighting through the talk as well. Um, so, yeah, we'll just maybe just do, do a few more questions. Um, yes, you'll go. Someone, someone asked, does the IET have any dyslexia resources? Um, there's none that I'm aware of, but there definitely might be. Um, I don't know if you are aware, Matthew. Uh, I haven't really dug into the IET dyslexia resources. So. Um, another one. So, what's what's the most helpful life hack that that you found from the website? Oh, what's the most helpful life hack? What is my favourite? Ah, my favourite one to tell. So we just do that. Is one called Google it. So you're typing something into a word processor, and the example I use on the website is the word rises. Now. You struggle the spell rises you've tried multiple ways and spell check it just ties itself in knots goes i don't know what you're trying to say but i do know there's a batman movie called the dark knight rises so type in the google the, the dark knight and your misspelled version of rises google knows you're trying to look for the movie corrects the spelling for you also gives you the movie poster <laughs> with the word rises on it that you can copy and paste into word and and fix it it's also a good excuse to Google Batman at work. <laughs> good one. Um, okay, um, people keep giving us more questions. <laughs> um, okay, someone's saying they've, they've just started um, a level three course in maintenance and operations engineering and struggling with reports, getting stuck in a loop, reading them over and over again. Um, so basically saying is there a way i can get out of my own head if that makes sense um and they're, they're maybe panicking a bit about the assessments which are coming up okay um i wonder if they're using any of the assisted text to read tech technology to read the report back to them You're, i used to find that getting it to read it back if you haven't got any of that i can't remember which version of word it is onwards but I think the latest Office 365 even has that built into it and read it out. If not, your iPhone and Android will also do it. I think um, that's probably a good way. You, you, you're surprised actually by listening to it. And I used to pace around the room because I don't mm -hmm. know why I have to pace on the talk. Um, 
but you'd hear stuff and you'd be like, well, that sounds not right. That's not what I mean. Or you could just hear it back to you. Like if, and imagine you're somebody listening to somebody presenting this subject going, no, that's not right. So try that, try getting that out of your head. Mm -hmm. If you're still struggling and that's not the issue you've got, if you're not, not panic, if you're panicking about how it's written, but it's actually the content, maybe you should go talk to your tutors and go over with them how you feel about the subject and maybe there's something you might be missing but that's more of a general thing for not even just dyslexic people that's generally I imagine even neurotypical people get tied in knots when they're not confident about a subject yeah okay um, yeah just going back to IEP support someone's commented that there is some dyslexic support through the uh through the mentor service and then I've just got somebody who says that they can't type, so we need to um, speak to ask their question. So I think, yeah, sorry, I, I have seen, I think you do have the facility to raise your hand. So if you do that uh, now, then I can, um, I can, right. Uh, right. Oh. oh, there we go. Yeah, so I'll allow you to speak now. It's Brian, isn't it? Nope. There he is. Nice. No, that doesn't seem to work. Oh, that's a shame. Yeah, it, it is a bit of a flaw, isn't it? Doing a webinar about dyslexia where you have to type the questions. Yep. Um, okay. Yeah. Let's uh, go back to. Um, okay, I think I think we'll okay. After this person, let's just try the raised hand one more. Okay, there we go. No, it doesn't. It doesn't seem to be letting me do it. Ah, oh, that's a shame. Well, let's take one more question out of the queue. Oh no, is it working? Yeah, is that? Can you hear me now, Brian Reynolds? Oh yes, yeah, see, my name's come up. I can see, mate. Good, good. Matthew, I must apologise. I was going to get back to you and speak to you. All oh, right, yeah, no problem. Uh, right, I've been very busy. Right, I'm a member of the IT part of the Birmingham Co Committee. I started my institute member as one of the small institutes I was amalgamated in 2006. I've realised I've struggled with the IET's system. I was diagnosed in 2001 as a very mature university student at the age of 50. Right, so you worked my age out straight away, I hope it'll be quick enough. Um, I did, like yourself, Matthew, I did the old, I did the old sitting girls courses before the BTECs. Mm -hmm. Then 30 years later, I took on a degree course. I knew that my brother who's younger myself a dyslexic i got myself diagnosed diagnosed and i was terrible so that then we might realize what's more my, my strengths and weaknesses are and that sort of thing yes i can think of practical things and i can think of solution but i have trouble english grammar writing things down so in 2015 i challenged the new incoming vice president about the strategy of diversity and dyslexia within the, within the institution and within six months, he came back to me and said, I want some help on my own organisation. And since then, there's been a small forum of people within the institution, which I'm part of, under the, under the diversity manager, who is now waiting to be appointed for the new one. And we are looking at some of the processes of the institution. For instance, I don't do CPD. That's the one thing I cannot do. I just cannot, I'm not, not creating enough writing to do that sort of thing. And someone who's well done has found the uh, found the dyslexic community within the communities. Yes, that is, but it is going to go to a new platform. I'm behind that as well. Um, the aim really is we will be sort of trying to go through every institution process to how can we, if you're applying a member, how you can do it in a different format, i.e. do it as a video. Mm -hmm. <coughs> The engineering council know we're doing this and they're saying oh you're leading this carry on so there is some lots of working very slowly in the background i think it's going to take five to ten years to sort it out 
my view is those people are potentially going to be apprentices is the, and technicians. That is the greater area that people need the support of getting the right skills to get into getting the right apprenticeship so they can work forward into the institution. But we've got to start with the main body of the people in the institution first and then work it out. There is one book in the institution about dyslexia in the workplace, um, which is freely available to any, any institution member. So that's I arranged that several years ago. But I will quickly say my own experience is <coughs> the trade union do a document about dyslexia in the workplace. That's a very quick, useful read. But the problem is getting the resources. Like you, Matthew, I've got Dragon Naturally Speaking. You can easily go and buy it from PC World, but where can you get support? It is very limited to get support and it's very expensive to get support. And the queue is enormous to get that support. And that's the problem all dyslexic have is getting that support once you're di diagnosed. It's like, you know, Sorry, it's a bit of a lecture, but sorry, I hope that's helped other people out as well. And perhaps, you know, we all have different experiences. So thank you for listening to me and thanks for allowing me to go through. Um, yeah, thanks, thanks, Brian. OK, um, yeah, so I, I think we're um, yeah coming coming to the end of the talk now. I know yeah, some people have had to drop off because we did say seven till eight. So I think we'll. Well, do you want one more, one more question? Yeah, why not? Well, let's grab another question out in the chat to finish off um, and then we'll, we'll wind it up there. Yeah, so uh, just, just last question. Do you have any tips for um, dyslexia for doing a master's in engineering? Pretty much the same tips as doing the bachelor's, really. Um, I think engineering suits the way dyslexic brains work anyway. Quite a lot of STEM stuff does. Uh, we've spoken about quite a few of the tips through the course, and if you are now transitioning into a master's and you've heard a new thing this evening that you're not doing it's well worth finding your university's dyslexia department or whatever they want to call it and asking them what help is available dsa is, is really helpful and it certainly helped me through my university and i think one of the reasons i'm here today to talk to you about it rather than still giving up on university and going back to the previous job okay Great. All right. So um, let, let's leave it there and I'll give my another round of applause for that, <laughs> which I'm sure would be much louder if this was a, a real event. And there's lots of um, lots of comments coming here, lots of, of thanks for, um, for the webinar, excellent presentation, great presentation. So um, yeah, thanks a lot for that, Matthew from, from IET. East Midlands and yeah I'll, I'll close the webinar now. Yeah. Thank you everybody for listening it's been really interesting seeing trying to keep up the chat on the bottom and listening to some of the questions too. <laughs>